we will do our best. And if folks can hear me okay, we'll kind of uh, get started in a minute. I'll uh, I'll play the Super Bowl ad. Oh, that's good. Thanks, Jake. Um, I'll play the Super Bowl ad in the back because I think a lot of people recognize it. And uh, but what's funny is that you know it was a great ad. Those kids were awesome. But I'm going to tell you the origin story when we get started, and uh, we didn't start with little kids, so um, it'll be good. You'll get to you'll get to see kind of where we actually started. Um, actually what I'll do too, so I put together like a list of resources, you know, for people to refer to, you all should be able to see that. Um, <laughs> so, um, and in there, there's some links to not only um, some of the resources that we've kind of collected over the years, the first and foremost being um, the support site, but uh, there's some really good stuff in there. I'm gonna, I link to as many of the uh, peripherals that I'm gonna show today as I can um, in that in that deck. So we can, and we're gonna go through that. So just to kind of like give you all an overview of how, how this is gonna go today. Um, I'm going to give you like an intro into why we did it and sort of how the, the, the device was developed. I'll lightly touch on like, maybe not lightly, I'll touch on like how modular input for gaming is enabled through the Xbox adaptive controller. I want to spend a lot of time though on showing you like basically options um, for things that can be plugged in. And uh, yeah. That's what we'll kind of do today. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to show you where the, the adaptive controller actually started. Um, this is a video from our 2015 hackathon where we met Ken Jones of Warfighter Engaged and Sergeant Josh Price here. And Ken was building rigs for vets who were injured, who couldn't use a regular controller. And he used a bunch, we used a bunch of different things. He basically take a game controller and crack it open and break it apart and um, sort of enable people um, through soldering wires to, to an existing Xbox controller. And that was, that was when we met Ken. That's how we met Ken. Um, he came to, to Microsoft and basically made us realize that like we created the barrier. So according to the social model of disability, we created the disability because we were gating interactions through this device, our beloved Xbox controller. So, uh, oh, Bob can't hear any sound. Oh, sorted, good. Great, Bob, cool. Um, so, with our beloved Xbox controller, this thing had been optimized over so many generations. This is a ninth generation game controller. So that's the latest Xbox and, and Sony game controllers are considered ninth generation. Generation one is uh, the Atari 2600 controller, which I will show you in a minute. Um, a little bit later on, we'll see some gen one controllers. Um, but like over all those generations of devices, they were optimized around a primary use case that made a ton of assumptions on how they were supposed to be used, right? Game controllers assume you have two hands to hold them, that you have two thumbs for these sticks, that you have a fluid range of motion to get to all these bump buttons, that you have to reach with your index finger to get to these bumpers and triggers, right? Those are, these are all assumptions that you can, that it has. Game controllers assume that you have the strength and the endurance to hold it. And so what we had to recognize when we met guys like Josh, we had to recognize that we created the barrier for people who couldn't use the controller as it was designed. And that's what how uh, the social model of disability works. That's one of those things that we always sort of uh, imagine and think about. 
And and while the social model of disability is not the only model of disability, there's lots of them. You should pay attention um, to them all and kind of understand um, them. But you should recognize that the social model of disability puts the onus on product designers um, to basically know when we have we're the ones that created the disability. So yeah, game controller. So what we do? We went away. We met. We met some other folks. I'm going to show you another video. Um, this is another guy we met. This is Corporal Todd Nicely. Todd a bit. And uh, Todd, you know, Todd came to us um, with Ken again from Warfighter Engage. This was all before the adaptive controller. And you can see here that Todd's a, a quad amputee. Um, and, and basically... He had a custom rig built for him by Ken that not only leverages, like that leverages all four of his, his limbs, you know? So, and uh, right now he's playing, uh, right now he's playing Killer Instinct, but he really wanted to play Call of Duty. Back then I was, uh, I wasn't sure if I should, uh, uh, if I should play Call of Duty with the vets, but you know what? They all love playing Call of Duty. So that's their, that's their jam. So yeah. Again, modularity, how do we think about devices? I will say that um, as we think about the Xbox adaptive controller, for me, you know, being on this journey, we, we definitely started from a very specific place and kind of worked our way out. Um, so I don't want to pretend like we made a joystick for any particular type of limited mobility, but we, we definitely started with limb difference. We moved on to quadriplegia. We moved on to cerebral palsy, and then we moved on to neuromuscular conditions. So whereas I think we're really strong in limb difference and neuromus and, and quadriplegia and cerebral palsy, we have things that we could have done better, I think, with neuromuscular conditions. But, you know, we still do a pretty good job, um, but I think there's still a lot of work for us to kind of do there. So... Oh, actually, I'm going to get something to show you guys because I don't ever get to show this very much. So, one sec. I'll be back. You're on the bottom. Spent all day setting up in here and I forgot these things. Um, I'm going to show you the original prototypes from the hackathon project for the adaptive controller. So when we met Sergeant Josh Price, this was the original prototype that we made. It is an add-on for an elite controller that plugs into the bottom, um, through the PMD port. This is ports that happen on Xbox controllers. So we created this, you know, quickly to, to, and rewrote the firmware on the device to, to allow for people to. Um, basically plug in wires and, and have them fire off buttons. So that was the, the first gen prototype. And the second gen prototype, which was done a year later, which was done by some students, started to incorporate three and a half millimeter switch ports. Um, there isn't enough ports there for every aspect of the controller. So we were going to leverage um, splitters and that just became complicated. Plus there is the reason why we were using going in this direction was that we always wanted people to, if they were able to use part of a controller to be able to use part of a controller, we didn't want people to have to buy things that they didn't, you know, that they didn't need. So we always wanted to make sure that people could use parts of a controller that they have. It was really important to us, but there was actually a feature that um, really kind of opened up not only like how we approach the making of the device, but actually different types of input, which was called Xbox Copilot. Um, and Xbox Copilot actually came out about a year before the adaptive controller was even launched. And what Xbox Copilot allows you to do, it allows you to take any two Xbox controllers and tell the system that they're one controller. So it gives you that ability to basically like say, these two are one controller. So if you, let's say you're our limb different, and you can use like this half of a controller, you might use the other one on your chin to like basically move the stick and you you'd basically be able to like modulize your, your controller system that way. Um, and that really gave us the freedom to open up what became the, the, uh, the Xbox adaptive controller. So 
for those who who've never seen it, um, you know, here's the Xbox adaptive controller, uh, A, B, D pad, U menu, Xbox button. But on the back is um, a three and a half millimeter switch port for every aspect of the of a game controller. There's 19 switch ports, and there's also USB ports on each side for joysticks. So this is how the device works. If you're not familiar with switches, switches are used really very often in the disability community. Um, if you've seen, they're, they're re really quite common and we didn't want to reinvent anything there. And so what I want to show you about switches is switches are actually really simple. So what I've got here is I have, this is a piece of, uh, th this, this wire is basically lighting wire, like what you'd use with a lamp. And then there's this three and a half millimeter mono switch that basically has these little, see if I can get that in focus. I don't think I can, uh, it's a little too close, but you, you basically just screw these in two parts of the wire. And then on the other side of the wire, I have these two connectors. So what am I going to do? I'm going to plug it in to the B button on the controller. I'm going to hold this up and hopefully when I touch these together, yeah, it backs out. So I'm hitting B on the controller. Oh, going into Minecraft now. I hit B, B, B. And that's all a switch is. All right, so I'm going to actually remove it from that port and I'm going to plug it into the A port. Same wire. I'm going to actually, I'm going to, I'm going to unplug it for a second. Um, I'm going to take this arcade button, which you can get on Amazon. They're about $1.50. I'm going to plug it into these connector ports that I have in this wire. And all a uh, normally open switch does is cr it finishes the connection and that's what fires the button. So just like touching the wires together. So if I plug it in here, when I press this button, Alex there should jump up and down. Which is it's easy. That's what switches are. Switches are really, aren't really that complicated. But what you can do with them is it tends to be pretty powerful. Um, oh, yeah, that's pretty cool, David. David's saying that people have um, taken old USB mice apart and made switches from them, which I think is really ingenious. I will say that I think I wish we were a little bit more relaxed with um, what can be a, considered a switch. And so what I mean by that is, you know, if you, if you look at the cost of, of switch interfaces and devices, it can get pretty pricey. Um, but if, you know, if the manufacturers of switch inter, of switch software would allow people to say, set buttons one and two on mouse on mice to, to be switches, you can get a, everyone's got a two button mouse somewhere in a drawer, right? Now, all of a sudden, you know, you're reusing all those things. It's one of those things that I think about quite a bit. Okay, so I'm going to show you this setup that I have here, but I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to, have to move some stuff around. Um, is there any questions, I think, before I go into this sort of setup? Yeah, I'll move back to it. Okay, I don't see Q&A. Nope, we all seem to be pretty good. So I'm trying to show, I'm going to back up. Because I want to see, there's a button on the floor. All right, you have to take my word for me that there's a button on the floor. I don't know if I can back up quite that much. All right, that's work. So what I've got here in this setup, and today I'm going to just use the Xbox Adaptive Controller just as it comes. I'm not going to do any of the remapping or um, any of the other kind of special features of it. Um, cause there is quite a, a bit of software features with the device beyond copilot, but for now, I'm just going to use it as is, cause I want to show people, um, sort of what's possible. So to refer back to like Todd and, and Josh, you know, the whole point of the adaptive controller and the reason why we call it the adaptive controller is that it adapts to you and not you to it. So the whole point of it is that we're trying to make this thing work so that you can put a button or a switch or a joystick where you have movement, right? So when people come in, we get a lot of folks who come in who've been injured and they talk to us and they frame their challenges in terms of what they're missing. 
So if someone comes in and they're limb different and they just recently become limb different, they often refer to, to what they're missing. And what we try to do with, with the people that kind of come in here and work with us here in the Inclusive Tech Lab is to ask people to tell us what they can move and not what they can't move or what they don't have. Right. So we've put buttons wherever people have movement. We've taped buttons to eyebrows. We learned that from special effect. You know, there's lots of things that that we put buttons on. So what I'm going to show you right now is um, actually I'm going to go over the, I'm going to pull it back for just a sec. Sorry. Should have practiced this more a little bit more. So I'm going to show basically what you can kind of see here is so I've got the adaptive controller. There's a makers making change um, IV nunchuck adapter on a Wii on a Wii nunchuck. There is a bunch of switches. One of them's plugged into the floor. There is uh, some switches here from the Logitech Adaptive Gaming Kit. Some of them are labeled, some of them aren't. Um, but we'll use them to play Minecraft. And then I have over here, I have a Makers Making Change Oak Joystick. Okay. And then on the floor, I have uh, a Buddy button, an AbleNet Buddy button. Jump. Yeah. Okay. Let's get that back set up. Now I'm tilted. <laughs> Great. Okay. So, got Minecraft. Alex is there. We nunchuck. Alex is moving forward. Left stick. You know, just as you'd expect. Um, to look around, I've set up the oak plugged in to the X2 port. And I'm going to use my face to move around with right stick. So, if someone... And only use one hand. You know, this is a viable way for them to, to use it. The other parts of the big buttons, when you have something like an, like this nunchuck style controller, is the big buttons allow you to basically hold this and still hit these other big buttons. So it's another way to, to kind of think about that modularity. So one more thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put this down for a minute. I'm not going to use it. And I'm going to... I'm going to focus on the button I have on the floor. One of the things that you can do with the Xbox adaptive controller, and this is right out of the box, I have this, this big blue button on the floor plugged into the X1 port. And X1 by default is left stick forward. So if I step on this button, Alex on the screen is going to run forward. So what does that mean? It means that in a, in, a third, in a third or first person game, you can basically play with no hands. Well, except the this setup I have. But so I'm running around, I'm steering with right stick. So I'm steering with my face. Look at all the buddies. And then if I let my foot off the button, if I depress the button, it'll it will uh you know it'll stop running. So I, I've set it up this way to show you a bunch of different ways that you can kind of I'll uh, kind of play. So I'll put this one back in here. This one's moving again. So I can do A, I can do jump, I can do B, which is crouch. I can do X, which brings up this menu. B to get out of it. Y brings up the inventory menu. B to get out of it. Now these two bu buttons over here are bumpers. So um, I'm going to move through my inventory. I'm going to basically whoop, look down. And let's uh, spawn some parrots. I'm going to spawn some more parrots. So that's how we think about modularity. I'm doing it with these like large buttons right now. Um, but yeah, that's that setup. Funny, you know, I don't know how long I was going to be today because I was kind of, uh, we're going okay. How are we doing so far, folks? Any questions or anything? Great. So yeah, um, I wanted to show you all. So switches are simple. Oh, there are questions in the Q&A. Cool, thank you. How are you connecting the nunchuck to the Zach? Okay, Robin, that's a good question. 
I am using a maker's making change IV nunchuck adapter. So this is the plans for this are up on the maker's making change website. And I have linked in the document that I put, um, in the, ch in the chat, um, there's a link to the page for this, for this device. Um, what type of mounting arm are you using to mount the mounted jo the oak joystick? Wow. Good. I didn't talk about mounting today, but it's, it's actually interesting, Jake. Like there's lots of mounting is really hard. I don't know exactly what mounting arm this is off the top of my head. I must admit, I I tend to look for 11 inch or longer cheap stuff on Amazon because I don't, I have a bunch of Manfrotto stuff. I have a bunch of uh, Ram mount. I have a bunch of um, all, all kinds of mounting, but I must admit, I, I personally like to see how cheap I can be with a lot of this stuff because I want to tell people. Like, I don't want to have to tell people that this mounting that I'm using is like $200. Um, I kind of learned this philosophy from like this place. Um, most curious is okay. And that's cool. I'll, I'll, I can follow up with some mounting stuff. Um, I, I learned this philosophy. I visited this uh, hospital in Jerusalem called Aline and uh, they used consumer grade medical equipment throughout the hospital because their philosophy was that you know, if people are going to go home, they didn't want them to get used to hospital grade or, or um, medical grade equipment and then go home and have to get used to um, home home equipment. So they would have like, you know, home ventilators throughout the hospital and things like that. So, yeah, I always try to find like the least expensive um, options that I can. Um, but, you know, I do have some RAM mount and some Mojo mount and other, other kind of more traditional um, mounting that you'd see in the disability community. Thanks for letting me know that there were questions and uh, yeah. And Jake just threw in the Ivy, um, some resources for mounting. That's cool, Jake. Um, why don't I follow up with you about that, about mounting? Okay. All right. So I went through that. So let me talk a bit more about copilot for a second, because copilot's one of those things that, um, can really empower folks. And it's starting to, and it, and it keeps getting better. It slowly keeps getting better and better. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a setup that I've got over here. I'm, I'm not going to be able to demo it because I can't switch games that quick, but, but it's a, it's a decent setup. Um, and, and all of these resources are in, um, what I sent you. Um, so this is a Hori, um, steering wheel. And what's great about this particular Hori steering wheel for Xbox Series X and S is that you can co-pilot it. So you can set this up as a co-piloted device and, you know, use it. And so what, what I'm trying to show here is I'm going to use this. This is a Warfighter engaged um, switch. And again, I, I've got it in the resources. Um, this one is for heads. So it's like a head array on a wheelchair. It's also for legs. It's basically just a Y. It's actually for anything. It's just a Y switch that like you can go on either side. And so really simply, I can take like these two switch ports. I could go into an adaptive controller. I could go, oh, right trigger, left trigger, right? And then all of a sudden, like I can use my head to accelerate and 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 reverse. And then if I you know, can get a grip on this. What maybe I get one of those grip assistant gloves that, um, you know, are available now, all of a sudden, like just with like a few simple things, I can have full access to a, to a racing game, but it's only because design for Xbox peripherals are starting to become co-pilotable, which is, which is really cool. And it's starting to open up a lot. But I'm going to show you some more. Um, this one's brand new. I couldn't even find, I've got a link to it in the document, but I couldn't find the, the, the webpage for it. This is, uh, the hyper X Tonto mini controller. I love small controllers. So, you know, this is a wired one. So you, you, you need to, it is cord designed for Xbox controllers. Aren't wireless. This one's wired. Um, it's super light and it's really small. So for some folks, like this could actually be super powerful because like sometimes controllers are just too big, but you can co-pilot this to an adaptive controller too. Yeah, Tyler, the, it is. It is really cool. The Tonto is really nice. I'm, I'm always on the lookout for small controllers. It's always really hard. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to get to the. And then sort of lastly, um, 
then for of the co-piloted devices i want to show you this is a hori fight stick for xbox series x and s and you can you can set this up actually as a game controller and you can co-pilot it so it's got you know it's got a traditional kind of clicky sort of joystick here for someone who might not have a lot of fine motor control you know there's some buttons um, they might just want something that that looks a little bit more traditional like this. Um, we certainly see folks all the time who who want um, arcade sticks, and, and there's a whole and there's I'll I'll show you some other sort of options that we've kind of that I've made over the years. But I want to get on to um, I want to start showing some of the things that can be plugged in, and I think first and foremost who who I'd like to kind of acknowledge because they were wonderful partners for us was was logitech g um they made the logitech g adaptive gaming kit and um this device was sort of a this this set of of switches was was a godsend they actually um just so you know if you they also make a version of this um for the new playstation access controller and if one of them's out of stock you can get the other one because they're just switches right like i just showed you what switches are it is, you know, this. You might want the stickers, the right stickers for the system that you want, but the the actual devices will work, you know. And and the greatest things about like, you know, this was this one for the Xbox was a hundred dollars. It came with twelve switches, and it came with switch mounting. My one of my favorite parts of the switch mounting was that they had these um, they had these boards. Are you able to blend inputs via Copilot? I'm going to answer that in a second, John. Um, so this, this is a, a mounting for the switches. It's flexible. What I like about it is that you can not only mount switches flat, but you can think about mounting switches up a face too. So all of a sudden, you know, if you don't have a lot of movement, you could put a switch here, you could put a switch here, you could have two, right? You know, different movements. Don't just think of switch layouts in these like 2D um, ways. Think about them in 3D ways as well. So John has a question. Um, are you able to blend inputs via Copilot? If I have someone who can do most of the driving but might, might need some assistance here and there, can I have a Copilot controller take over? Yeah, absolutely. So the whole reason why we made Copilot, and actually the reason why we sold how we sold Copilot to our executive team was that we told this story um, of like really little children playing video games and not doing so well. And then the parents come in and they show up and they try to take the controller to show them how they do it. And the kid starts crying because they didn't want their controller taken away. Um, but the thing about Copilot is we could co-pilot two controllers together. And then the parent could be there helping the kid, kind of nudging them along the way um, as they were going through a game. And that's and and we've done that a lot. Like so you can certainly be a person's co-pilot. That was the reason why we called it co-pilot. Now everything in Microsoft's co-pilot, so they'll probably change the name of, of Xbox co-pilot. I don't know if they will, but they I can't, wouldn't be surprised. <clears throat> um, but like, yeah, you can, the the devices are, are um, it, it really isn't that complicated. Like if you co-piloted two controllers and on one you move left stick fully to the right and the other you move left stick fully to the left, um, it would your character would be like kind of moving back and forth in the middle because they're they're equal. There's no um, there's no way to say like one co-pilot controller is sixty percent and the other one's forty percent. They're they're just equal. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. I'm gonna go into the Q and A. Cool. So yeah, hopefully so far so good. Um, other things I have over here just to kind of show. This was my box of uh, where I had the the homemade switches. There's actually a lot of switches you can get on on Amazon. Switches, like I said, they're industrial things. This is a really lightweight one. It's nice. Um, I I wrapped it in uh, sh heat shrink tube so that you can basically use it. But yeah, I make a lot of switches. I don't make as many switches as Tyler and Chad do, but um, I make a lot of switches. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go through some other ones. Okay. Gonna move over here. All 
Now it's hard to steer this camera. Sorry, folks. Back up a bit. Okay, so stuff in here that I wanted to kind of show because um, there's all kinds of switches in the world. Um, this is an ATEC Ultralight. Um, this is a very, very good switch. This is like a, a workhorse. There's an equivalent AbleNet um, Ultralight. These are for people who have very little strength. They're very light touch. Um, this is a bite switch. This is actually made for uh, skydivers. <laughs> this one, uh, this one. So this was one you'd put in your mouth, and it, it, it's a bite switch. Uh, this is more of an industrial foot pedal. Um, you can buy these. You can buy these, but I actually made this one. You can because the foot pedals themselves, if you buy bulk foot pedals, they're really cheap, and then just attaching a three and a half millimeter to them isn't really that hard. So that's one um, that I. I uh, made um this is a proximity switch this is an ablenet uh, i think it's called the mini candy corn there's a bigger one um this one you just have to sort of wave your hand over it and it'll fire the switch um it takes a battery you know i mean it's basically like you know the towel dispensers and restrooms and things like that there's a, a n more ablenet switches we've got a spec switch here and then there's a a big buddy and then over here this is a buddy uh, a jelly beamer uh, switch and the re and the receiver. So this is a wireless switch. Uh, but uh, to show other people who make switches, this is a smooth, a smoothie. I think it's called a smoothie. It's a smoothie from uh, uh, Pretorian in the UK. I'm going to let someone in. So smoothie switch, great switch. Some other fun stuff here. This is from um, Enabling Devices, and this is a sound-activated switch. So you basically plug a microphone into this, or it has a microphone, but you can also plug one in. And um, it will fire a switch when you hit a certain decibel threshold. And it also has the ability to latch the switch, and you can time adjust it. So it's quite an interesting device. Um, you know, it's interesting to see how a lot of these things that that you know you used to have to buy specialty devices for we're trying to build into our, our newer systems um this is a a latch box from one switch in the uk um so this is a this is a, a switch that allows you allows you to do latching so latching is basically for those who, who might not know you press a button and it stays pressed until you press it again um, that's what a latching switch is and then this is an AbleNet uh, Dual SLAT. I don't think I couldn't find the link for this. So this is a this is another timer based switch and another latch box. I couldn't find the link to where to get those. I don't know if they make that anymore. Um, but that's that switch is there. So these are are a bunch of the small ones I was sort of showing. Yeah, you're welcome, Bob. Um, I've got some more stuff of your stuff to show too. What's the lifetime average switch in a rig? Oh, like how long do switches last, Jonathan? I think that's a good question, actually. I think it's really, it varies a lot. I mean, it depends on how, it depends on how, um, how much you hit it. I will say that like, I've never, I know how long the switches in the adaptive controller last. I don't know if I can say like in general, how long switches last. I think it really depends on the switch. And especially if you're talking about someone with high tone, it can get pretty gnarly. Okay, I'm going to move over. Are there any more questions about those other switches for a second? Before I set this up. Okay, I'm going to check the Q&A. Okay, back to the chat. Okay. I got a lot of stuff here. Um, I'm actually going to turn myself around here so that I can, I can kind of see a little bit of what I'm, what we're showing. Um, these are a bunch of joysticks, whole bunch of joysticks. First, I'm going to start off with um, this. There's this great guy in Texas. He's got this Etsy. Uh, he's got this Etsy store called Seven Mile Mountain, um, and he's he's putting out a ton of stuff. So. He's putting out like um, adapters for Wii nunchucks or Wii nunchuck style things. He's putting out, this is a dome, uh, a dome style joystick that works really well with the Zach. 
And then this one is actually a touch based joystick. I love this thing. So basically like it's just capacitive, but this is a joystick for folks who, who want um, capacitive. I think, I think we could do better on the sensitivity curves on in the Zach to make something like this a little bit more viable. But the fact that this exists is really wonderful. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I know we're all sort of sensitive to the cost of a lot of assistive technology. So I wanted to show, um, some things here that are, that are pretty inexpensive that you can get. This is a trooper two from hyper, is it, is it hyperkin? Yeah. From hyperkin. So this is the Atari 2600 first gen joystick that I was talking about. Um, but you know, if you, if you were old enough to remember Atari 2600, uh, you know, I think this is better quality than an Atari 2600 joystick, but it's, it's not, it's not super great. I mean, it's okay. Um, it's, you know, but it's, it's really inexpensive. And if this is the kind of thing that you want, this will plug into the Xbox adaptive controller. And then, you know, for your Commodore 64 fans, there's one here too, that has a, a whole bunch of uh, more buttons. Again, super inexpensive. Um, one of the workhorse joysticks that we talk a lot about um, when it comes to the adaptive controller is the uh, Ultra uh, Ultra Stick 360. And this is a version of the Ultra Stick 360 with a body point sort of handle on it. This one comes from um, this one comes from from Quad Stick. So the people who make Quad Stick, this is one there. And then there is a fancy Ultra Stick made by One Switch uh, with this nice cool uh, with this nice cool shiny handle. But the Ultra Stick is great. Um, I will say that for for some folks who need a T bar mounted joystick, this is a good option. It's really robust, but I wish it didn't spin. But the way that the joystick's constructed, it spins. So sometimes folks get a little off kilter um, with this guy, with, especially if you've got the t uh, like a any kind of T bar goalpost kind of mounting. It's tricky. Okay. I was going to say, I had a, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Jake, for letting me know about the, the, yeah, the uh, AbleNet. Um, two other joysticks, uh, flight sticks. Um, I will say that when we started with the adaptive controller, you know, we worked with Logitech for this Extreme 3D Pro. It was it was really easy to get. It was fairly inexpensive, and um, we looked at. We didn't really know a lot back then, so we we used this. I will say about flight sticks in general. Lots of flight sticks do work with the Xbox Adaptive Controller, but the way that you configure them can be a little bit tricky. Um, the other flight stick I have here, and I'll I'll get into that. The, the other flight stick I have here is the Airbus, uh, is this brand new line of Airbus um, flight sticks from Thrustmaster. Um, this one in particular, you can set it to Xbox or PC mode. So if you set it to Xbox mode, it'll play. It's for flight simulator. It won't play anything else but flight simulator. Um, the cool thing about this is that these, these two pieces here on the left and right pop off and you can have like other ones pop in. So you can basically design a, either this stick to be either primarily left-handed or right-handed. Um, the reason why I say flight sticks are tricky is that through the USB ports on the Xbox adaptive controller, we only accept eight buttons and these, and flight sticks have more than eight buttons. So there's lots of stuff on flight sticks that just don't translate. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I, we've heard a lot of feedback about that. We continue to hear feedback about it. Um, you know, we have reasons, but, you know, always tell us your feedback. Um, we'll get it to the right place. Um, but yeah, I like this one. This one's brand new. I just got this one. Um, another pre Trorian, um, Optima joysticks. It was really great to get this, um, on the system. This one has, and, and this is actually the one that we give people when they don't like that this one twists. Right, is that we we give them this one. This this does not twist. This will your hand will stay there. The the stick doesn't move. Um, and so this will plug into the adaptive controller. You can put some switches on it. This is another wonderful joystick. The the adaptive controller. Cool, cool, cool. Um, all right, moving on again. 
We doing all right? It's so weird not being able to just see folks. A thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you, David. Okay. So what I got here, what I'm going to show here, this is a quad stick. And it's just on a stand. It wouldn't really be mounted like this. None of these would be mounted on these stands. I'm using these ram mount stands because I didn't want to bolt them to the table. I'm spending the decisions. Yeah, I will, Tyler. Ask, I, uh, I will uh, I will on that. Let me save that one for like a Q&A thing. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is the this is the quad stick. Um, wonderful mouth control device has three sip and puff tubes, and this four sip and puff tube is a mode changer. And then this button here acts like a shift button. So there are lots of uh, tetraplegic gamers that can do all, everything with just this device. Um, it's a wonderful device. We wanted to have that um, with the Xbox adaptive controller. Um, the reason why there is a power port for a, a wall mounted plug on the uh, Xbox adaptive controller is that this device draws more um, more power than what USB can uh, charge a device with. So it's it's uh, we we were in a we were in a situation where if you plug two of these into an adaptive controller, it would have been possible to drain the battery faster than we could charge it. So that's why um, for non low powered USB devices. There is a, an optional uh, DC port. So the next uh, one that I'll show is a, a bit of a, a, it's actually kind of old now. So this is uh, this is the lip sync from Makers Making Change. Um, and I say it's old because there's a brand new lip sync that uh, Makers Making Change has just um, published specs for. This is a, an original lip sync. Um, the, new, the new lip sync looks wonderful. I can't wait to build one. Um, got to get some folks in on that, but that's, uh, that's something that's really, really, uh, fun. And so you probably are looking at, you might be looking at this, wondering what this is. This is a really fun story. So we always see people use controllers with their face and we were over in Paris and we were working with, um, the folks who make, uh, one of, what, one of the, oh, what's the charity called? Kanam? I think it's called Kanam. Um, and we were there and at their booth at a game show, they had this, they had this little mounty thing for, for Xbox controllers. And it just kind of slides on to this, to a Manfrotto arm. And I was like, what is this? And it's this little th thing that you can buy. You can still get them. It's basically but what it's for is it's not for mounting controllers like this so that you can use them with your face. This is so that you can hook up a hookah pipe to your Xbox controller so that you can basically smoke and play games at the same time. That's what this is meant for, is that you'd put a hookah pipe in there and you plug this into the, your controller so that you could have like a, a hookah attached to your controller, which I think is hilarious. and But awesome, like, I mean, it works so well. Um, one thing that I kind of wanted to show um, for any kind of face mounting stuff or, or using game controllers in general. Um, these are silicone stick extenders and grips um, by Foamy Lizard. Um, and they, you know, there's different heights. Some of them are taller than others. They have different patterns. But I really recommend these a lot to people. Sometimes people come in and they're like, oh, my sticks are just a little too short. And I just pull this out. It's like 10 bucks for a pack. And all of a sudden, like, you know, problem solved. Um, but that is also in the link in the in the chat there all right keeps on going this isn't even all my stuff guys i know this is uh like i'm just showing you different stuff i have like so many different things um i love this device this is by a wonderful man named uh david uh he runs uh, an organization out of uh france called hit click um, this is one of his original devices. He's got so much nicer ones now. I got to like go and, and, and update my collection a bit with him stuff. Um, but hit click. Uh, there's a link again in that document to, to, to stuff that he's got. This is totally homemade. Um, and what I wanted to show about this is that sometimes arcade parts can be really, really um, handy. And they're they're fairly inexpensive. So 
Um, this is a, a tray, a cheap serving tray, cheap wooden serving tray, and two joysticks for um, like from an arcade setup, like for those guys who want to set up like arcade boxes in their own own home. So you want to search on Amazon for for MAME controller USB or something like that. Again, it's in the chart. Um, and what I did here was basically on the back, I, I leave this flap that you can open it up, but you can kind of get at all the, the two US, there's these two USB controllers. So you'd put in a USB cord through each of these like slots in the side, you plug it in here. And it allowed me to create this kind of arcade style. Um, th these are for movements. If you've never seen uh, a joystick like this or a, a set like this. So in, this is for like fighting games, like people who, who want to have like this kind of setup. So it's, I can't remember exactly what it is, but, but it's, it's basically like WASD, but on, you know, on a, a keyboard, but this is, this is relatively inexpensive. I think both, I think both kits of joysticks and buttons were like less than, than $50. And, uh, and, uh, yeah. And then the tray was like five bucks or better. Um, Again, sometimes, you know, you just want to have things that, um, you, you just, you just need sometimes things to be a little bit different. So what I have here is, uh, this is an arc, another one of those main USB arcade setups. Um, but what I've done is I've mounted it. I've mounted it into this generic, um, fight stick enclosure that you can buy on Amazon. Again, links in the, in the dock. Um, but I've mounted it. I mounted this enclosure upside down to make a, basically a left-handed version of a fight stick because you can't really find left-handed fight sticks, you know. Um, so all this just one single controller plugs into the adaptive controller, and again, this adaptive controller is mounted on a, a little uh, stand that's um, RAM mount. It's using the mounting on the back of the adaptive controller. You know, that's built into the device. Um, but the reason why I have this set up like this is again, to think about like, well, you know, you can, you don't have to be flat. You can go in different dimensions and think about all those sort of things. So that was everything I wanted to show. And I'm happy to take more questions. I'm going to set up this camera better. Am I right in thinking these are all boxes of switches, but the Xbox adaptive controller is the microcontroller? No Arduino in these controllers. So I can't speak for the makers making change stuff. There's definitely some Arduino in there. Um, everything that I showed was, uh, most of what I showed was, was switches. Um, things like the Oak joystick that I showed in the very beginning from makers making change, that's just a 10 K potentiometer. Um, and so you can buy the, there. That's really simple. We, we, we allow you to plug a 10 K potentiometer into the X one and X two ports. That was, that was us acknowledging that there were a bunch of makers out there who didn't want to have to cr use Arduino just to make a joystick, um, which has been really great. I mean, it was, it was wonderful. Ken Jones actually asked us to do that and we did it. And now the, the PlayStation access controller supports those two. So it's really cool. Um, that, you know, you can basically use a 10 K potentiometer based joystick on both the adaptive controller and on the PlayStation controller. Um, so yeah, so yeah, uh, sorry, David, I'm not answering that a hundred percent firmly. It's always kind of a bit of both. Um, I want to get back to Tyler's question. Um, would, would I be willing to expand on the decisions into the number of buttons through USB? Just curious. Yeah, I will uh, own up to the fact that that was me. Um, we didn't, I didn't know at the, so at the time, a PlayStation 3 controller was a HID controller. And there were versions of PlayStation 3 controllers, and I didn't want someone to plug in a PlayStation 3 controller. And, and basically like have full access to it. Um, there were, there were a lot of things when we were developing this that we were just really nervous about. We didn't know, we didn't want to make, um, we didn't want the adaptive controller to become this like device that could open us up to, 
to to things that we weren't aware of. So we were very conservative. At first, I actually only was going to let four buttons in, but we we loosened up and, and moved it to eight. Um, that being said, you know, I think it's something that we could totally revisit. I think it's one of those things that, I mean, you know, we always want to try to revisit this stuff, but it's one of those things that I think we kind of could get back to. I will say that I'm, I don't work on the adaptive controller day to day anymore. It's more Caitlin Jones of Warfighter Engage. She's also a Warfighter Engage. She's of Xbox. She works for Xbox. She works on all this stuff day in and day out, but she also works at Warfighter Engage. So Tyler, I hope that answers your question. I know it's not a great answer, but yeah, it was my fault. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Oh my gosh. I left all this time for questions. Think there'd be questions. Actually, I didn't leave much time. We're actually almost right on time. I think one of the things, oh, yeah. I think one of the things that is really hard for for us who work in assistive technology, I know I know I've talked to to Tyler and Chad about this. I talked to John about this. Um ooh, that's a good question, Tiffany. I will get to that. Um I think one of the biggest things that we've realized in all the years that we've had the adaptive controller out and and then, you know, the adaptive accessories for PC and other other things that we've put out is that um, it's the awareness of what of what is available is of one of the biggest challenges in assistive technology. If you think about assistive technology abandonment, and you think about, and I don't just mean awareness as into as in just finding the assistive technology. We ask people sometimes to really change their mental model of how they interact with computers um, in very, you know, challenging ways. So it is understandable to me that when someone now, at the time it wasn't when we were first starting, but it, it's understandable to me now to see someone take a game controller and then like kind of mash it against their face and use it because in their brain, that's how they think about the adaptation. They're not thinking about like, um, analyzing their own movement. They're thinking about how do they get to what's the minimum distance between where they're at now and where they used to be is in terms of movement, if, if they were someone who has, has a kind of an accident. Um, and so that awareness is really, really tricky because like when the adaptive controller came out, we met people with cerebral palsy who were like, I'd never even thought video games was a possibility. So not only did we have to show them that video games was a possibility, we had to show them people like them so that they could just get their head around the fact that there was even possible for them to play games. Because if the world tells you that doing this is playing video games and then you can't do this, then you think you don't play video games. So, yeah. Um, so I'm going to answer T Tiffany's question. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, what are you passionate about working on right now? You know, I'm still, I'm still super into to hardware input and human computer interaction. I do think that we we definitely everything that we've learned with the adaptive controller and the adaptive accessories, the way that we think about um, input is that we think about multimodal input kind of all the time. Um, we think about how um, how people should be able to use any type of input they want interchangeably. And so what I mean by that is like, you know, on Windows, you can use mouse and keyboard. They're two different input modalities. You use them both together at the same time all the time, right? No one thinks twice about it. But why not like gaze and voice or keyboard and, you know, gesture? Like there are all kinds of input that we could do. Keyboard and switch, voice and switch, right? Um, there's all kinds of stuff that we could do that we just, we just need to get people to think about multimodal input. And I mean, it's a tricky problem. I mean, there's lots of people tackling it. I think what's wild is that like when we launched Xbox One, like more than 10 years ago, more than a decade ago, um, we had Connect on the device and you could use voice or gesture or controller at any point in a workflow on the on the home screen. And, and you know, 
that was something that was unique at the time that I don't really know if people have really replicated since. I mean, you can use multimodal input on lots of devices, but can you can you seamlessly transition between one and the other at any point in the flow? I think that's that's a little bit different. So yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking about right now. Um, uh, what are the input options you wish you had? I always wish, Jake, that I had more joysticks. I always wish that I had more joysticks. Um, can never have enough joysticks. I think I think the perfect example of joysticks in many ways too, and and almost the awareness problem in this not not awareness problem, but there's also this thing that where people where people want to, you know, where, where people want to engage with games in ways that are similar to other people. <clears throat> so what I mean by that is, let's say like we had brain interfaces tomorrow, and you can play any game you want. You don't have to touch anything, and everyone's in this, you know. The reality is, is people like to play video games, like who like to touch things. They like to move things, right? Like when pe when when we show people this button, like let's say there's someone with muscular dystrophy, sorry, this joystick, this touch-based joystick, they can use it really easy because there's no resistance. It's just their finger. But they tell us they keep wanting a lighter joystick because joysticks are gaming. So they tell us like, but I want a joystick. Well, why do you want a joystick? Well, joysticks are gaming. And, and you know, you can't really argue with that, but like you're sitting there going, but you, you don't have the strength, like the, 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 the spring to move a joystick back to zero might be stronger than what the strength that you have. So, but you know, everyone keeps wanting a lighter joystick. So yeah, joysticks for me is, is kind of godsend. It's always joysticks. I always wish I had more joysticks. Um, have there been people you wish to help that you don't yet have controllers for? That's a really good question. Uh, I don't know. That's a really good question. I mean, you know, um, I hear Bob who's on the, I think Bob's still on the call. Um, I think Bob might show, um, is going to might be doing some um, assistive technology stuff um, from their own collection now. And they have a, they have a way to hook up eye gaze to an adaptive controller. So I'm excited to kind of see that, um, see what that goes. Um, Bob's asking about the Zach 2.0. I don't work in Xbox, so I don't even know. It could be happening. Um, I mean, I'd probably know, but I don't know. Um, do you find that people want designs to be unobtrusive and not highlight the user's differences? Yeah, stigma is really a really wonderful thing to think about. I will say that with the adaptive controller, when we pivoted from our original form which was an add-on for a regular controller to this bespoke device. We did get some feedback from the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. Richard Ellison basically like sat me down for 45 minutes and told me how I was wrong. Um, and it was really good feedback. It was all about stigma. It was all about the fact that, you know, there there's definitely something to having the same device that everyone else has in a more accessible way. So I don't, I, you know, we struggle with uh, with this a lot, with stigma a lot. I mean, that being said, you know, we we really thought about it a lot. We made a device that felt like a consumer product and not like a medical product to avoid that kind of stigma. But, but yeah, I think about stigma a lot. I mean, I also think about changing stigma, right? I mean, we talk about stigma in here in industrial design all the time. You know, um, glasses were once stigmatizing. Now no one's stigmatized over glasses, but they're still stigmatized over hearing aids and uh and other canes and things like that so there's certainly a, a thing in culture about destigmatizing assistive technology um as a as a really interesting topic for industrial design i mean we we do our best but you know um you know if you if you if you ask me i'm, I'm just like you know in many ways i'm just like everyone else in assistive technology to be honest in the sense of if you tell me to prioritize features versus simplicity versus stigmatization, I'm going to give you features every time because I never know. I never, you know, I, I, I always know who I'm not including when I don't, when I don't have the features. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's not that I don't think about simplicity or stigma, stigma, but it, it is one of those things. This is a sentimental attachment from hardware that defines gaming. Yep. Yeah. Any comments? Uh, that was a great question about rapid fire. There was a great question. 
Any comments about how to create the modded functions with switches like rapid fire that some clients might need? Okay. Yes. It is a great question. And it is something that, um, that I basically fight with my peers here in Microsoft about. So I show up in meetings and say, I want macros in game controllers. I want, um, I want rapid fire. I want those types of things. And then I have a contingent, um, of my peers that go, that all sounds like cheating. And I go, but I'm doing it for people with disabilities. They need it. It's not cheating. And that's where the discussion happens, right? And I don't always win. I lose sometimes. I lose quite often, to be honest. Um, but we still keep fighting. Um, because cheating is one of those things in gaming. I, I just I call it a ghost story, you know? Like all you have to do in a in a in a, in a meeting around gaming is is mention cheating and everyone like basically like it's like mentioning security in like a Windows meeting. It's like oh everyone everyone backs off all of a sudden, <laughs> you know. Um, but I do think as a gaming community we need to define what cheating is. Um, that's that's why with the Microsoft Adaptive Accessories, which I'll do in an upcoming version of these for which are for PC, we do we not only do macros, we do crazy macros. Because you can do lots of things on PCs that you can't, that would not be cool on console. 640, 640K and eight buttons are all you need. That's right, John. Uh, input, SACQ. Sorry, just catching up on questions. Yeah, I mean, I think. I think I think rapid fire is important. I think there are there are ways to kind of deal with it too, though. I mean, there there are tons of devices that do it. Um, I just, I, I you know, I think the other part that I just to be honest with like kind of everyone, you know, I'm going to be posting this publicly. Like, you know, my my team at my the, the the team has a lot of of different things that they have to weigh. So, you know, we do our best to to encourage like them to to intentionally include people with disabilities in the things that we make but there are certain things that where they're just ner where they just don't want to go because they're worried about other parts of their their work and their business and all that and you know um I want them to make adaptive controllers so I have to be a good partner you know I can't always just sort of show up and and you know yell at them and things like that so you know I have to be a good partner uh ta -ta -ta. There could be cases where games like Fortnite anti cheat might misinterpret the macros. Yeah, so you're absolutely right, um, Dave. Uh, David, there's lots of things where there's lots of of algorithmic ways to determine cheating, um, and and we relied we we also use those as well. Um, I mean, the one thing when the adaptive controller came out, people were like, "Can I plug a mouse in there?" And I'm like, "No, you cannot." You cannot plug a mouse in the adaptive controller because that was something that, you know, that's, that's basically the, the big thing that we're all trying to avoid. That was really insightful. We've encountered similar problems, but still fighting. Thanks for sharing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Well, I hope this was useful. I've gone over time. I thought I was going to, I was worried that I wasn't, I was going to be super quick. But I got to nerd out on equipment with everybody today, which is fun. I don't typically get to do that. Um, I don't keep all this stuff out like I have it today. You know, I spent like a couple hours like laying out, you know, put taking everything out of the cupboards. So, yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. I, I can stick around if anyone wants to, to still ask questions. But yeah. <laughs>